I've attended classes that begin with a mini meditation and uh, and I think it's it's nice to begin meetings like this with some regulation. So I want to invite you to think of yourself, imagine yourself as a breathing tree. And with every breath, you feel flows of air going up and down inside of you. Uh, usually what I do is as I inhale, now with the blue dots, I visualize a flow rising from the roots up to the foliage. And I think openness. And then as I exhale, I, my mind moves down towards the ground, down and in towards the body. And I think stability, this comes from, from yoga. As, uh, as Alice knows, we were together in a yoga teacher training. So we'll keep this page up for maybe just a second and maybe we should launch in at five past. Thank you, first of all, for joining today. I'm very excited to join Purva in, uh, in scheduling this live chat. We're gonna try to keep it very brief. We have a whole hour scheduled together, but we, I will try to speak for maybe 20, 25 minutes and then, uh, and then have, a few, have a bit of a prelude to the Q&A by um, giving you some provocations, uh, challenging some of the preconceived ideas that we have about how the brain works, especially the developing brain, and then open it up for Q&A. Two words about me. Um, so why, why I'm here talking about brain science for parents today. I offer the following perspectives. I was brought up multiculturally in uh, nine countries with a number of languages and schooling systems. And hence, from, from the beginning, I got a sense that there are different recipes for creating um, human beings. And giving birth to two children in different countries and raising them in different countries, I also got a sense that things are done very differently in different places. Uh, which sparked my curiosity about let's get down to the biology and try to understand how things work. My first career for about 20 years was in business, uh, about half of that in human capital. So uh, after an MBA and leaving banking, I started strategy consulting and went towards consulting in human capital. So I was an executive recruiter for global organizations uh, like the World Health Organization, the UN Population Fund, the World Bank, the IMF, and uh, big universities. So the world of education and global health uh, has, been, um, has been one that's been close to my heart. And the issues of maternal, child, adolescent health were also some that I was looking at uh, while I was in business. My second career, uh, more recent over the past four years, I dove into neuroscience and psychology education. Oh, and the little, the, the little characters there are representing my family. So upbringing me alone. My career number one for the greatest part was as a single mother with my daughter who's now 15. And career number two was sparked by leaving the business world with a pregnancy of a little boy who's today four years old and raising him uh, in a partnership. And so we're now a family of four. Uh, so neuroscience and psychology education, at the same time, I've been providing over those years support on a parental crisis line, uh, as well as help in a therapeutic playroom for a few months of those four years for children. And, uh, and I'm getting into social and emotional learning in a school, which I am joining this fall. So over those four years, uh, I have read a tremendous amount of very well-written books, academic papers, listened to podcasts. These are my top ones about the topic that we're going to discuss today. On the left side, you have the more accessible books, uh, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog by Bruce Perry, who's um, a psychiatrist and uh, neuroscientist. The Gardener and the Carpenter by Alison Gopnik, who's out here in Berkeley and who I met a few years ago. Uh, it's the only parenting book I've ever recommended. She studies how the brains learn. And, and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have books that are much more technical. The Brain from the Inside Out is written basically for physicists, but it is very well made. So this presentation bit will last maybe about 15 or 20 minutes. 
15 or 20 minutes are not enough to describe the brain. Um, there are so many different ways of studying it. Um, I can tell you on the anatomy piece about the amygdala, the hippocampus, the neocortex. These are words that you will have heard. Um, it will be a little bit pointless because they will not be sufficient in themselves to explain how the brain works. We can talk about networks, which are immensely complex, the density of connections between the amygdala and the cortex or between the amygdala and other structures in the brain, the synapses, uh, you know, all of those things. Chemistry, neurotransmitters, you've all heard uh, the words dopamine, oxytocin, uh, serotonin, cortisol, and so on, uh, or um, how hormones affect the brain. This adds an additional layer of complexity. And uh, electric waves is the physicist's way of looking at the brain as well. So all of these things together make the brain practically unfigure outable. It is the most compli complex thing in the known universe. So for parents, you know, I can mention a few words, but it's not uh, that like, like this will make any real difference in the way we think about our children and the way we behave towards our children. Uh, so I want to focus on what neuroscientists know is no longer true. <laughs> because, so, so this is a quote from Bertolt Brecht uh, that I like very much. The goal of science is not to open the door to infinite wisdom, especially as regards the brain, which is unfigureoutable but it is to set a limit to infinite error. So let's go into a few ideas about the brain and the developing children, which, uh, which we have thrown down that chute into the basement over the years. Uh, these are beliefs that have not stood up to the evidence. First of all, the child growth only requires nutrition and hygiene. During the London bombings, um, during Second World War, children were dispatched to families uh, in the countryside, either their own or foster families, and some to, um, uh, to nurses and doctors or institutions of some kind, where they got custodial care, so good hygiene, good proper nutrition to the extent possible, but, uh, but not a lot of relationship. And what they saw was that the, even physically, five-year-old kids looked uh, much, much shorter. They, they had the development of maybe two or three-year-olds by the end of, um, of the war. Another example that many people know about, especially since results were published quite recently, uh, are the Romanian orphanages that were discovered by the global community after the Ceausescu regime toppled in 1989. So by 1990, a lot of countries started adopting children, uh, and uh, we are seeing about 25 to 30 years later that uh, the sequela in the brains, not just in the functionality, but it also in the sheer size of the brain of these children who are now you know, 25 to 30 years old uh, adults, um, it has left an impact. So the idea that very early childhood doesn't really matter because children don't have a memory of what happened before they were three or four is, uh, is completely debunked. So down that chute it goes. Another belief is that the brain is an organism that reacts to the world. So there's, it's dormant, a stimulus comes in, it wakes up and it makes a decision. That's not the way the brain works. It actually pings the world to create information, but we'll see that later. Now, my favorite and the one that I want to focus on, it's probably going to be a bit more of the theme uh, of this talk, is, uh, is this view that I, as a Greek, feel responsible for because I think it originated in Plato uh, in antiquity, that, that human beings have a bad side and a good side, and hence uh, you know, the way we raise children is based on rewards and punishments. And that is a view that, um, that uh, neuroscientists would, uh, would disagree with uh, in terms of the developing brain. The developing brain has capabilities and it has needs. And the way to behave towards it is by regulating, relating, and reasoning. Uh, not with rewards and punishments, it does not work as well. So what do these words mean? 
So I want to make it, uh, I'll be using a lot of metaphors. Uh, that's, how, that's how I come to understand things, but also that's how I think I can make them very memorable to you. Uh, an ice cream, as you know, if you have, uh, if, if you build them strategically, you put the thickest, most decadent triple chocolate at the bottom. These are the things that are going to be uh, the most intense and then maybe a fruity one or nuts in the middle. And then the, let's say, lavender with honey, very delicate stuff at the top. And the same goes with those faculties. Regulation is the, the most important, biggest and strongest relationship is right there. And then, and then reasoning capabilities. So what it means is that, let's say you have a distressed child or even a distressed adult or even yourself. When you're out of balance, one of the first things to do is to try to regulate the body. For a child, you will do it with a hug. For yourself, you might do it with exercise or sleep or a meal, whatever works. The second step is to show the person that you're interacting with that you understand them. And th by that, th that's what we mean by, by relate. It really hurts you what just happened, either physically or mentally, you're really upset, I understand you. I don't necessarily agree with you, but I understand you, I'm reflecting your feeling. And then the third step is, let's talk about what happened, uh, what made this situation come about, or what can you try next time? This is something that, works with children, but I must say that even on the parental crisis line, a lot of the training uh, that volunteers get in order to provide that support to families um, is based on those concepts, is that you want to help the adult that you have in front of you, who is an expert in the life of their own child, to feel secure, safe, that there's confidentiality in the relationship and security, that they are understood, and then to help, uh, you want to help them consider what alternatives one might consider going forward. So it works for children and adults. Now, why are some of these um, uh, faculties deeper and, uh, and more foundational than others? It has to do with how the brain develops over life. Newborns begin with body regulation, uh, but they can't fully do it. There's a number of things that they do at the moment of birth. If they're preterm, they will have even less ability to do those things. But there's things that they cannot not yet do at, work, at birth, for example, regulating their temperature. Now, as you grow into a toddler, you begin to, you know, you can regulate most things, you potty drain, but you're also able to co-regulate with an adult your state of arousal or calm. You can get hyper excited playing rough housing with, uh, with a babysitter or a parent, and then that same parent or someone else will calm you down to put you, you know, to read stories, bath, and, uh, and go to bed. So they co-regulate. The self-soothing is an ability that develops over time. It doesn't happen very early. And then attachment starts forming. A baby does not distinguish your own face from another face. Uh, they distinguish the voice. They may express some preference to the voice, but, a real attachment like distress when you are leaving and leaving the child with someone else that appears after a few months after birth now after attachment if things go well then children begin to form affiliations and friendships uh, of course after co-regulation they're also able to self-regulate and then the additional reasoning competencies uh, are beginning to appear Normally, if everything goes well, adults should be able to access all these capabilities. Now, we all know that this is not universally true, um, but an adult who knows their physiological tendencies will also regulate themselves preemptively. Um, I have found, for example, that uh, during this pandemic, I've had a heightened need for regulation, and although I've never jogged in my life, I've taken this up. Uh, so this is what I call preventive net regulation. You know that you will be a better person if you do certain things, even before finding the need to do them. Um, in terms of relating, tolerance and respect can start appearing for people that you don't know. 
uh, and then emancipation, individuation and emancipation. So they deplete with aging. I believe in reverse order, although I'm not quite sure. Uh, just remembering my beloved grandmother, I do remember that thinking went first and then caring and eating went last. How do these capabilities develop inside the brain? We will switch to another metaphor. And this is the metaphor of the tree, because unlike an ice cream, you don't have bits of anatomical parts in different parts of your brain uh, uh, that, that sit there next to each other. The brain is very much a network of interwoven um, dendrites and axons and synapses. They, they are, it's, a, it's an integrated network. And that's why I believe the tree is a great analogy. There's flows going up with the water and flows going down with the sugars, creating all the wood after photosynthesis. But it's also a volume thing that I like a lot. Uh, I don't know if you, can, you guys can see me as well as the screen, right? I'm speaking blindly, but I believe you can yes. see me. Yes, we can see you. Yeah, okay. So uh, an easy model for the brain uh, tends to be your hand. So you, the, the, the root, the, the deepest part of your brain can be your forearm, like let's say your spinal cord and the palm of your hand. The limbic system is your thumb, and then the neocortex is all the fingers going on the top. So if we look at this tree, the palm and the, and the, the forearm is the, the roots. And because they are just a huge volume, that's what we call the reptilian brain. I like to, I like to emphasize that because it is one of the most understated parts of the brain. It comprises close to 80% of all our neurons. The thumb, that limbic system, is tiny, so that's, it's the trunk, it's maybe a bit like a filter, but it's absolutely critical. That's where the amygdala is, the hippocampus, and other critical parts. And then the neocortex, it's kind of the neo-mammalian brain, the one that we humans are so proud of, the one that uh, apparently uh, gives rise to all our thoughts. That's 80% of the mass but it's not that many neurons, right? So it gets a lot of the credit for everything, but, um, but let, let's dive in to see uh, what constitutes all those things. So I've drawn a number of little uh, cartoon characters to try to explain uh, these different parts. As I said, it is in part pointless because that's not gonna change the way we behave towards our children, but it does help when you hear one of these words, when you stumble upon an article or something, you will be able to, mem to remember kind of where does that sit in that, in that inhabited tree of a brain. The reptilian brain uh, is the one that is closest to all the bodily functions, right? It's the autopilot, it's what keeps us alive when we're not thinking about it. Thank goodness we don't need to remember breathing, keeping our heart beating, regulating our blood pressure before we stand up or sit down. All these things are done automatically. It's composed of, uh, I would say, three dinos. There's a big, massive dino, dino which is the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the cerebellum. And then there's the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, which I call hug and tug. The parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest part of the autonomous nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system is the, is the one that spends energy, the one that, that, that gets uh, activated and aroused for action. They're held together by this strap that the parasympathetic nervous system holds, which is the vagus nerve. So when, when you're going into hyper arousal, when you're getting very upset, your sympathetic nervous system tends to be very activated. And, and there's less uh, vagus control. But if the parasympathetic nervous system gets into very high gear, for example, if uh, you are in uh, the woods and there's a bear and you know you're about to get attacked, there's, there's no point pumping all the blood out to your extremities to run and flee because if you get wounded, you will die more, more quickly. So that's when you get into a freeze response where actually everything shuts down slowly so that will have chances of keeping you alive until someone finds you. So that's the parasympathetic nervous system yanking on the vagus 
and, um, and creating this freeze response that keeps us alive. So this dance between hug and tug um, keeps us in good states of arousal and calm. The, the balance between these two is developed over the first five years of life. Um, if, if things are really difficult in your life, chaotic, unpredictable, very tense, you might have dysregulation between the two parts of the autonomic nervous system that may continue over life. It will be hard to change those parts. So neuroplasticity does have its limits. The limbic system, here's a big number of critters there in the, in the trunk. Uh, it's um, the seed of feelings, we say, but feelings is a, is a vague term. Uh, you can talk about body sensations as being the roots of feelings. You can talk about affect as being a very simple kind of feeling. And you can talk about emotions, uh, more complicated ones like disappointment or feeling disrespected or all these things, which are, which are really thoughts. They're not really feelings. So the limbic system basically is a, is a quick way of ascribing meaning to your body sensations based on what you remember having experienced so far in life and rushing to action quite quickly. I'll go into a little bit of detail. Uh, there is, uh, there's four sets of critters here. At the very bottom, the, these angry birds that are close to the dinos, as you know, birds are the descendants, is the stress response system with the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Then we have, so, so they are, they are as, as the name indicates, when, uh, when you fear that you saw something that is threatening to you, you can immediately launch um, uh, um, a cataclysm of, uh, of chain reactions that will, um, that will get your energy flowing to the right places in order to avoid that threat. The amygdala, has commonly been talked about as the seat of fear or aggression. In fact, its role is broader than this. It also gets activated when you see photographs of, um, of um, people from your childhood that you were very close to. I mean, it's, it's actually um, a place that ascribes some valence to, to, um, to memories. Maybe we can talk about it as implicit memory, affective memory. Hippocampus, I represented with a squirrel because the, um, the shape is a bit like the tail of a squirrel, but also because it hides its acorns all over the place and remembers where to find them. Uh, the hippocampus encodes memories, explicit memories, episodic memories. They are, um, it doesn't store them, but it knows where to, where, to, um, where to hide them, where to store them in the cortex uh, and the cerebellum and other places. The dopamine reward system, it's closest to the top of the brain, that's the ventral tegmental area and um, uh, nucleus accumbens, and they throw a ball to each other, which is dopamine. <laughs> so that reward system gets you driven towards things. Uh, it's very commonly talked about in the context of addictions. So all those critters together uh, are what we refer to as the limbic system. The stress response system is closest to the, the reptilian brain and uh, the, the reward system is closest to the neomammalian brain. So the neomammalian brain, I call that the liberty layer and I represent it with uh, this modified uh, Statue of Liberty so that we remember a little bit about the lateralization of the brain. So, it is a popular myth to think of ourselves as left-brained or right-brained. This is not uh, true. We're not completely one or the other. But the fact that we have two hemispheres in a brain does in part serve the function, although everything happens everywhere, it does in part serve the function of um, uh, learning what's new. Uh, so that's the right side holding the torch. This is where you're scouting out novelty. And then that book, uh, I call that her to-do list, is uh, things that she has learned, right? The neocortex is this surface of the brain where a lot of the thinking uh, 
the, the deliberating, the inhibition, the control, the planning, all of those things happen up there. It's like a pizza in terms of thickness and size, and it's all scrunched up. And when, when people have um, hemispherectomies, you know, that, that is the layer that tends to get cut out. You, nobody can survive if you cut out the whole hemisphere of a brain, but that top layer, it's kind of like pruning a tree with the branches. You can do that and still operate. So for people who have epileptic seizures that are debilitating, uh, sometimes cutting the, cutting the two hemispheres and removing one part can, can help. It's the one that's last to mature. It's most shaped by learning. And it is, as we said, somewhat lateralized. So you will have heard the terms prefrontal cortex or the insula, the interior cingulate. These are just uh, a few of the, the key players in that. So like a tree develops with sunlight and water, the same, the brain will get tuned by the climate in which it's evolving. So I've used these two icons to represent stress uh, or stimulation with the sun. Um, and on the other side, water with representing regulation or soothing. Another way to look at it is engagement or disengagement. So the, the brain is kind of pulsing, paying attention and then resting. So now you're listening to me, you're not paying attention 100% of the time, even if it's just been a few minutes, actually too many minutes, uh, I'll, I'll speed it up. Nobody can pay attention constantly. You, you pay a little bit of attention, then it spurs a memory, then you sit back, then you pay attention again, and so on and so forth. That engagement, disengagement is, uh, is how the brain um, engages with the world. And the pattern of engagement and disengagement matters. And I want to go into an example that's uh, very well known in psychology, and that's probably going to be the most relevant for parents listening to the talk. As much as experiments with, uh, with animals uh, sound very cruel, experiments with children also sound a little bit cruel. Ainsworth, Mary Ainsworth was working with John Bowlby in the 70s and 80s uh, on the uh, attachment theory that John Bowlby, a pediatrician in London, had developed. And, and she designed an experiment to actually test the attachment style um, to see how babies who were 12 months old um, behaved when they were separated from their caregiver. Um, in most of the original studies, those were mothers in the US. So white mothers in Baltimore was, was her subset. Now, since then, it's been replicated in many places in the world um, to see how a child behaves when they're entering a lab with a mother, strange place full of new toys, what is their exploration behavior? Uh, how does the child react when the mother leaves the room? And especially how soon does the child calm down? Because a 12 month old baby will show some distress usually when the mother leaves. How, do they, how soon are they calm down after reuniting? Uh, that's the basis of the strange situation. Observing dozens of kids, uh, she called up her friend John in England and said, I seem to have three kinds of kids. My A's are the best. You know, they seem to be so independent already and strong. The B's upset and the C's inconsolable. And John Bowlby said, how do you think, are you sure you have three kinds of kids or are there three kinds of environment at home? So they extended the study to look inside the house how did the child uh, and parent, how was the climate in the house basically? When the child cried, did the parent come quickly, less quickly? How often were they within earshot? Uh, how often were they talking to each other? How rough or smooth, uh, how positive? She looked at a number of metrics and distilled things down to about six metrics. And I represent those three environments uh, like the houses of the three little pigs. Uh, high quality means very attuned to the needs of the child, quite positive. The middle one, sometimes attuned, and the, the straw house, like mostly not attuned. So if you were to connect those dots, um, what, what kind of child behavior would you connect with what kind of home environment? 
um, we're not going to have time to do a poll, but if you're like most people, you would connect those straight across. So the more nurturing, attuned environment, you would think leads to the resilient child. So we think that a child pretending they don't really care that the mother left and don't really pay attention when she comes back because they're busy with the toys, we think that that's an independent child and, uh, and that they're that they're the most resilient. Uh, that's not the case. I'm speaking as one of those A's. <laughs> um, so the actual solution is, uh, is different. The most nurturing environment gives rise to the bees, to the children who, whose stress response operates normally. Uh, it is very reasonable to be upset when you're 12 months old and your mother has disappeared because it's 12 months, you don't know that it's just an experiment and that she's going to come back. Um, the second house gave rise to the C's, the unconsolable child. When the mother comes back, they can't, they're very angry. And then when the child has kind of lost hope that help will be forthcoming, then they get into this, you know, I can only depend on myself. Uh, and just to clear any mystery, when I say that I speak as a, as a former A, um, I believe I was hospitalized uh, for a, quite an extended period of time, very, very young in life, and came back as a very easy baby. So my whole life I've been told that I'm such an independent kid. But uh, more recently, I think I, I discovered why that might have been the case. So, so how come uh, this is what happens? Because it is a surprising finding. If an environment has levels of stress and soothing that are patterned, they're moderate levels of stress and they're controllable, the child will get agitated and calm, agitated and calm, agitated and calm. And when there is a stressor, they will reasonably cry, protest, and then calm down again. That's an adaptive response. And if you want to increase that little pink area, increase the area for which a child is regulated, that's called resilience, then you have a patterned, moderate, controllable uh, training regimen of, uh, of stress, which grows and grows, and then the child will respond in, in turn. Anyone who has been either a musician or, or an athlete also understands that things get harder and harder and you get better and better, but they need to be done in a certain controllable path. If it is not those things, and I will just group these things for, for speed, if, if the stimuli arrive uh, chaotically, if there's too big um, or there's just not enough soothing, you will get into one of two of the stress responses, you know, either a freeze response or a fight or flight response. You'll be spending a lot more of your day up there beyond your regulated state, okay? So an important point here to know is that we very often talk about adverse childhood experiences and trauma with a capital T. So each one of these sons here uh, can very well not be uh, assault or abuse or uh, or violence. It can just be a sequence of events, an environment that is very low on soothing opportunities, too much chaos, too much disorder, and nothing, or, you know, too many relationships. Maybe a child for the first 18 months of their life has had like 13 babysitters. Uh, that wouldn't qualify as trauma with a capital T, but, but the child is left highly dysregulated. So in conclusion, uh, I want to say, finish with, a, with a, a, a paper that was published a few months ago where uh, little rats were put in, uh, mother rats with their pups were put in a low bedding environment, uh, which means cages where you don't provide enough material for the mother to create a proper nest. That's the standard way of stressing out mother rats is to give them either bad material or not enough material. And uh, their behavior towards their pups changes because they're so stressed about being unable to create a proper nest. They tend to be a little bit rougher, provide less grooming, um, and, uh, and hence the, the behaviors change. What the paper found was that the relationship effectiveness also changed, which means that 
when the mother was uh, relaxed and nursing the pups, measuring the heartbeat uh, and other kind of stress response signals in the pups, they found that these pups were not soothed. Even during a soothing activity, the pups were still stressed. So the stress of the mother due to her environment, she wasn't malicious or, or abusive, it affected how effectively she could calm down her pup. And then ultimately it also affected the, the, the pup's behaviors. It started sleeping further away. They, they more frequently slept further away from the mother and not, in, not, not near her tummy. Their stress response was affected and their capacity for, for a relationship and the way they interacted with, with other rats growing up was affected. So this is just um, an example that sums up uh, what we discussed. So now, I want to launch our, uh, our, our Q&A with three very short provocations to kind of bridge, connect the dots between everything I talked about and, uh, and things that are maybe a little bit tangible. And I wanted to take a few sentences that we hear very commonly uh, around us. The first one is that brains are like sponges. So remember that graph, one door leads to the staircase of wisdom and the other hatch door leads to kind of the basement of error. So when we say the brains are like sponges, I would like to say that uh, this is actually going down to the basement. Brains are not passive. So when we say they're like sponges, we mean that they understand and learn much more than we imagine. And that, that is true. But they don't do it passively by just being in an environment. And here, the way we acquire language is very important to know. If you just put a child uh, at the table, but you're talking to other people and, and, and the child is off to the side, they're not going to learn the language just by being there. Language is acquired by words directed to the child. There's an organization called LENA that measures conversational turns with children. And it found in a study um, that I read about about 18 months ago that they were measuring conversational turns in some caregiving uh, facilities, daycares for kids. And they found that about 40% of the kids were basically neglected in terms of conversational turns. Uh, I feel this way when I walk outside and I see uh, parents not talking to their children at all with, because the strollers are all street facing very soon. In England, there's a researcher who was able to influence uh, the government to give manufacturing and policy guidance to create more parent facing strollers. And, uh, and to actually influence the rate at which you will find this kind of equipment, vehicle uh, in another country. In the US, I believe you know, parents will just go with what they find in the market and what they find in the market is street facing strollers and people spend these valuable hours of exploration outside, but not in a lot of conversation. Always remember conversational turns. The brain is like a sonar. It will not learn just passively. This one makes me want to scream. I hear it very often. Children are so resilient. Uh, here I'll get a little bit dark, but if, if children were resilient and if my family was crossing the border and getting held up uh, uh, at the southern border of the US, each one in our own jail cell, my husband and I would kind of dust ourselves off at the end of that and probably recover more or less. Um, my daughter would probably need a lot of therapy uh, at age 15. She would probably be quite affected, but she would recover. And our four-year-old son, we would never see him again the same way we know him now. The, the, uh, the effect would be tremendous. So children are so resilient. I don't know where it comes from. I hear it all the time. And it needs to be replaced with children are so adaptable. So my son would adapt to the situation by shutting down. But that shutdown is not something I would like to see. So it is very important to think of the health of children and to try to uh, not rest on that view that, oh, whatever happens, it's okay because they'll bounce back like bouncy balls. Uh, to finish on a, on a funny note, 
uh, feelings are like farts is not something you hear, but it is something you hear covertly in some advice that, oh, if a child is having a tantrum, it must be their big feelings that are pent up and that are building up and that just need to get released and there's nothing to be done about them. So feelings are not farts. Feelings are a real signal. They are predictions. If a child is so dysregulated as to throw a tantrum and roll down on the floor, the amount of stimulation they have received has elevated them beyond the level where they can regulate. And your role is to help them calm down. It's not a, oh, not my problem. Uh, it's something that happens because that's what feelings do. They don't. In summary, what I want to say is that it's not what we know, it's how we are. As parents, we do best not when we read additional books about um, how our child is developing or things that are teaching us new tips and tricks for what to do when such and such behavior may arise, but it's in taking care of ourselves. Uh, we can do whatever works for us. Uh, if it's meditation, it's meditation. If it's um, exercise or getting good enough sleep, that's the number one priority. Um, as far as brain science goes, the things to remember for, um, for our children, I would summarize in three points. First of all, it's the patterns of activation that uh, developing brain uh, lives during the day that play the biggest part in forging them. So let's not take things personally. It's not because we are a bad parent that uh, maybe issues occur. Issues may occur because the whole environment, the whole climate um, can, be, can be very tense or, uh, or chaotic or disorganized for a child. So it is the environment. Within the environment, the point number two is that relationships are foundational. So if we find ourselves in a situation where both parents, uh, if they're both present, are working and busy, um, that, that doesn't mean that the child will compromise their developmental needs. One needs to bring in a regulating adult to take the proper care for laying the solid foundations in the architecture of the child's brain. It cannot be, you know, one day it's, uh, it's the neighbor who's going to take care of the other day. It's going to be an older sibling that might only be two or three years older uh, and will not be able to properly regulate the developing child. Uh, so relationships are foundational. That serve and return interaction is the food with which brains develop. And that is uh, truly critical. And point number three, uh, I'll go back to where we started uh, and say, forget sticks and carrots. Sticks and carrots do not work as effectively, but instead think, regulate, relate, and reason. I'm gonna make this regulate, relate, reason analogy tangible here with a real ice cream. The ice cream cone is the body in which we start by adding the chocolate as you see, it disappears inside, which is like brain and body are one. <laughs> we are completely interwoven. And this part is what more commonly is called self-care. The second piece we will add on top is relate. So we've chosen a fruity red color for the heart. So relate is what more commonly people say, you know, listen, listen empathically, listen to the child, understand, reflect the feeling. And only then do you go into reason. Reason at the very top, commonly known as problem solving. It's expendable. <laughs> you may not even need it, right? And that's your ice cream cone.